Hello, welcome everyone. We're going to give people a chance to, to filter into the webinar before we get started. If you're just joining us, we're just giving a minute or two for people to filter into the webinar and then we'll get started. Welcome to tonight's presentation. I'm Kim Calderhouse. I am the executive director of the Leelanau Historical Society. Uh, the museum is located in Leland, Michigan, and we have archives and research facilities, and we offer a museum right now. Our hours are Wednesday through Friday, 11 to 4. And we've got about six different exhibits at the museum. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please put those in the question, the Q&A chat at the bottom. And then if you have any um, questions about if you're having trouble with the audio or seeing something, throw that in the chat and we will do our best to troubleshoot that with you. Um, wanted to remind you that in November, that will be our last uh, presentation for this year. That is with Wayne Lou Sardi. He is the state maritime archaeologist and he will be talking about underwater archaeology off the Leelanau Peninsula. There is a link at the end of the presentation to register for that. Um, and then we always encourage people to consider donating. We do programs like this throughout the year um, and since COVID we've been doing them all on Zoom and your donations are appreciated to support the ongoing programming at the Historical Society. And without further ado, I will pass it over to Nicole. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, so I am going to, throughout the presentation, have my video off. My internet has been a little dodgy with the wind up here today. Um, but I am going to give you an introduction to the historic distribution and also global distribution and background of grayling species in general. Then we'll also talk about historical distribution in the US and in Michigan, what happened to them, and we'll cover the current reintroduction efforts to the state. Uh, and like Kim said, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat. And the first thing that I would like to do is acknowledge my primary funding providers, Charles Wilson and the Henry E. and Consuelo S. Wenger Foundation. And also my laboratory technicians, without their help, the project would not be going forward to the extent that it has. Um, they literally keep the lab running when I am away from it. Uh, so that's Tim, Mark, Josh, Bailey, Robinson, Shana, and the large number of volunteers that I've had as well, and additional funding providers. So we'll dive in now and cover first the broad spectrum of what is a grayling. So here in Michigan, um, you've probably rarely seen one. You may see a mounted grayling, some artwork, something like that. Um, but they are a member of the salmon and trout family, so Salmonidae. They are a cool, cold water species. They do have variable body color, and it's not a variable body color based on the actual species of grayling. It can be within Arctic grayling themselves, um, and they also have individually unique patterns of black spots on their side. So here across the bottom, 
from left to right, these are all Arctic grayling, all from the interior of Alaska. And you can see the variations in the body color. So we have the silver, a bluish purple individual, and then a gold colored individual. And these were all caught within approximately 100 miles of each other total. They also have a sail like dorsal fin with color patterning that is unique to each individual. And this makes them stand out from other freshwater fish species. So the males, their dorsal fin is so long that it will reach back nearly or go past their adipose fin. The adipose fin is a little fleshy flap that is behind the dorsal fin. So it's set right back here. If you can see my cursor, uh, it's just behind that dorsal fin. Females, their dorsal fin is a little taller in the front, but it's also a slightly shorter. But you can see the differences in the color patterning in these individuals as well. Again, these are all from the interior of Alaska. Um, this is so interior of Alaska is where I do my part of my research in May, and then I come back to my lab here for the rest of the season. Uh, so I have the opportunity to see the different habitat, um, the different features of Arctic grayling, and then I also get to look at their behavioral interactions and other things while I'm in Alaska as well. So, and also get some pretty amazing photographs too. So if we look at the world distribution of grayling, there are six recognized species of grayling found throughout the world. And in red, so the red coloration you see in the image is the range of Arctic grayling. It encompasses North America, Asia, and some limited Eastern European tributaries. So again, that is the coloration you see in red. European grayling, as you probably guessed, uh, the yellow coloration is found in European waters. Amur grayling is found in Russia, China, and Mongolia, and that is this larger black range here. The Havsgol grayling is found in Mongolia, and it is only in one lake, and that's this green coloration that you see here in the image. Baikal grayling is found in Asia, and that's that darker gray in between. And the light gray is the Mongolian grayling, and it is found in Russia in the Great Lakes Basin in Mongolia. So if we focus on Arctic grayling specific to North America, they're found in Northern Canada and Alaska currently. There are glacial relic populations in, there was in Michigan, and there currently are still in Montana. So you can see in this image here, the purple coloration is their current habitat range. You can also see in Montana, there's a little purple within this pink. The pink coloration is where they were introduced out west and the gray coloration. So this is all, it's supposed to encompass all of Northern Lower Peninsula and then a little spot in the Upper Peninsula. And that is where they were extirpated from in Michigan. So an extirpation is a localized extinction. So Arctic grayling, the species was a local extinction to Michigan. So that's why we call it an extirpation because they're still found throughout the rest of the world. They are spring spawners and they're idioparous, which means that they will spawn several times over their lifespan. The eggs are very small in size. So they're about two and a half millimeters total in their size. The fish mature on average. In, in Michigan, we're expecting ma uh, maturation to be between three and four years of age. Overall lifespan of Arctic grayling, if we're looking at all of their range, uh, is 18 years on average. The oldest that has been observed is 32 years old, and that was in Alaska. Montana, they average about five years. And here in Michigan, we're thinking that their lifespan is going to be in the realm of like five to 10 or seven to 10 years. So if we touch in the past, um, here's a couple images for you. So this, the image on the left is grayling that were taken from the Black River in 1903. And then you also see an advertisement on the right for the fishing line, which is uh, the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad. So they advertise that specific route to go up to Northern Michigan with the specification of catching grayling. So they were first discovered, definitely in quotes, because they were already there, in, uh, in Michigan in the mid-1800s. And a lot of that was from uh, people seeking out new logging ranges. 
And they were found in the northern lower peninsula. So all of that map that you see shaded in blue is where they were historically found. Uh, and that's all of the watersheds. So north of, it, it's the White River in north and the Rifle River north. Uh, if you look at your hand for the Michigan map, it's pretty much anywhere north of your knuckles. Uh, and then there was also a stream in the Otter River in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, so that is near the Keweenaw. And there's debate as to whether or not that was a native historic range population or if they were translocated to that location by early settlers from the lower peninsula. So there's some correspondences that are making us wonder whether or not the Otter River was actually a native in uh, range. So again, talking about fishing. So it's important to understand that the early fishing industry in Michigan had zero fishing regulations. So there was nothing limiting how many fish you could catch, um, size, nothing like that. Absolutely zero regulation. And it was accessed primarily through the railroad lines. And, you know, people really took advantage of the fishery itself. So there was rampant overfishing that regularly occurred. Um, grayling were caught in such large numbers that they were loaded into railroad boxcars and shipped down to Detroit, Chicago, um, and they would be used in restaurants. There's also documentations that have shown that individuals would go out and fish and they would pile up the grayling on the bank behind them until they reached shoulder height and then would take just a few grayling home with them. So they would pick out maybe four to five grayling and leave the rest to rot on the bank, which was of course incredibly unfortunate. Um, fishing parties were documented catching 500 grayling in a single trip. Um, and you know, there's a lot of records just really indicating that the early fishing habits were really disregarding the overall health of the population. So that real rampant overfishing occurred. So declines were noted in the late 1800s and overfishing was one of the primary factors that was leading to this decline. Other factors included logging, which in that time, the practices were clear cut logging. So you can see here in this image, um, the way the logs were floated down. So if you remember back to the slide where I was talking about um, life history of grayling, they're spring spawners. And logs were often floated down when the waters were the highest and the fastest, which just happened to correspond to the spring. So you had grayling that were trying to spawn uh, or fry that had just emerged from the substrate. And all of these logs are now starting to come down the tributaries and they're sloughing the substrate. They're scouring the bottom, they're scouring the banks. So the waters were getting incredibly turbid and it would clog the gill chambers of the fish and suffocate them. Plus it could also flush out a lot of young juvenile fish. Plus you had less shading of the tributaries and the way the logs were floated also contributed to widening and um, altering the stream in their channel themselves. So on top of overfishing and logging, you also had competition due to the introduction of non-native fish. So Pacific salmonids, rainbow trout, um, they were brought in and so were European brown trout. They were all brought in in the late 1800s and that caused competition for the resources. Historically as well, brook trout were primarily found in the upper peninsula. There may have been a few limited areas in the lower peninsula that had historic native ranges of brook trout, and those would have been fish that had migrated down from the upper peninsula. But for the most part, historically, it was grayling in northern lower peninsula, brook trout in the upper peninsula. People started to also culture brook trout and release them into the streams in northern lower peninsula as well as declines were being noted in the grayling population. So this all led to the extirpation of grayling in 1936. So could these fish have survived perhaps one of these threats? Possibly, but unfortunately we won't find out. Um, previous reintroduction attempts did occur. So the late 1800s through the early 1900s, they tried to expand the range of Arctic grayling in Michigan. And they actually attempted to introduce them to places such as the St. Joseph River. 
um, and other regions as well. Early 1900s, also, so 1900 to 1933, there were over 3 million fry that were stocked into the northern Michigan waters. Uh, 70,000 yearling were stocked from 34 to 41. 300,000 fry were stocked from 58 to 60. And then uh, the most recent attempt was 1987 to 1991. 145,000 yearlings were stocked into 13 different lakes and seven streams. With each one of these attempts though, there were th certain things that were noted. So you had rapid out migration. And by that, I mean, the fish were put into the streams and then they would in essence disappear. They would out migrate. And there's a few things that we think could have been causing that. Um, one of those factors we think could be unfamiliar water. So the fish, even the fry and the yearlings, they would have been reared in a hatchery type setting. So such as the grayling fish hatchery in Grayling, Michigan was originally constructed to rear grayling. The fry and the juveniles and even the eggs were incubated in the white building that are on the premises. And all of the water that was sourced for those young life stages was from a deep well. So deep well water would have a different odor than the stream water would. So once you take those fish out of the familiar water, so the deep well water, and you put them into a stream water, that difference in the odor could cause them to go and seek out the um, familiar smelling water. There was also other factors such as competition again with other fish that were in the streams. Uh, and then also disease outbreaks occurred in the hatcheries occasionally. So if we transition from the past into the present and what is going on now, uh, you can see a couple images here. So this is uh, getting ready to transport eyed grayling eggs. So an eyed egg is literally a fish egg that you can see eyes on. Um, so here I am at the uh, fish hatchery in Fairbanks and we're packing up the eggs in wet cheesecloth and getting ready to transport them as my carry-on uh, from Alaska back to my lab in Michigan. So one of the main components of the here is the Michigan Arctic Grayling Initiative. It was established in uh, 2016. There's currently over 50 partners and the overarching goal is to restore self-sustaining populations of Arctic grayling within its historical range in Michigan. So the first meeting was October of 2016, which was just when I was finishing my master's degree. Uh, and then we started planning out how the research would be done uh, in different factors that would be contributing to a successful reintroduction. And we noticed that there were a few key concerns. So the primary ones are the presence of non-native species. So this can lead to competition and predation. We also had rapid out migration. Uh, so it could be lack of imprinting, which I didn't touch on, which I'll talk about in just brief in a little. Uh, and then the unfamiliar water, which I did already discuss with you. And then also habitat requirements. So we did determine that habitat is available. That was a study that was done with Michigan Tech, um, but we need to address different connectivity concerns such as impoundments or dams and also climate change impacts to our systems as well. So probably wondering after I told you about all of the previous reintroduction attempts and that none of them worked, why are we trying it again? And a lot of it stems from success that occurred in Montana with remote site incubators. So these are two images and a schematic of what an RSI or remote site incubator actually looks like. Uh, in essence, they can Nicole, we can't hear you right now. You might need to re, um, restart at the beginning of your slide when we get you back into range. Okay. Okay, there, I can hear you now. Okay, good. Um, so where did I cut out? Um, pretty much right at the beginning of the slide. Okay, so when we're looking at the reintroduction and how all of the previous attempts failed, 
one of the big questions is why are you trying this again? And a lot of the reason that it's, we decided to give it another go was success occurring in Montana. So the Montana grayling populations were declining and they were having similar issues that Michigan did with reintroduction attempts, rapid out migration uh, and competition and predation. And one of the main ways that they were able to get around rapid out migration was by using remote site incubators or RSIs. And there's water that is plumbed to come in from a pool. It goes in through the bottom of these five gallon buckets and comes out into the pool downstream. And if we look at the schematic of this, it's this about how it works. So you have the inflow, the water diffuses through pea gravel and some biomedia, and then goes through the eggs that are held in an egg tray. Once the eggs that you can see here in the photo in the right, now note that these are steelhead eggs, grayling eyes, eggs are much smaller. So for visual preference, it's easier to see the steelhead eggs. So what happens is as the eggs hatch and they're ready to swim up out of a substrate typically, instead of swimming up through substrate, they just swim up off of the egg tray and they'll go out the outflow pipe. And they end up right into the stream that you want to reintroduce them to. And this helps them incubate in familiar water. So the water that they're incubating in is the water that they end up stocked to. And that really help in Montana. So my, my research goals here at MSU are to determine the timing of imprinting and grayling early life, which we think corresponds to egg stage. Uh, you cut out again, Nicole. I'm not sure if you can hear me yet. Can hear you, yes. Okay, good. Sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, so my, my research goals are to determine the timing of imprinting in grayling early life, which we think corresponds to uh, approximately the eye to egg stage, swim up and such, uh, which would indicate why the RSIs are actually getting around the rapid out migration. And then I also aim to determine the predation rates of grayling fry by age one brook and brown trout, and also to determine the impacts of competition with brook and brown trout of the same age class. So one of the biggest questions is how do you get grayling back to Michigan? And there's certain region, reasons that we selected Alaska as the source of the initial broodstock. A lot of it is the genetic so the interior Alaska population has never been stocked. It has high genetic diversity and that is helping us have a diverse brood stock. So you're at the whim of mother nature. So it depends on when ice out occurs as to when the, gray, the grayling adults start to migrate into spawn. Typically it's around mid-May. And the eggs actually hatch anywhere from 20 to 23 days after the egg collection occurred. We lost you, Nicole. Am I good? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, so this is an image of my lab at MSU. Uh, this was from 2018. There's been some changes since, but it looks very similar. So I have three artificial streams that you see here with the netting around them. And there's a sand filter, uh, a UV sterilizer and two chillers, and it's a recirculating system. So it's over a thousand some gallons. I can't remember right off the top of my head. Uh, and then here are the eyed grayling eggs on the left and on the right. And then in the center that is uh, returning from Alaska and I'm placing the eyed eggs into an incubation tray. So if we talk about imprinting a little bit, uh, imprinting is how a fish knows to migrate 
um, natal region. So think of um, Pacific salmonids such as Chinook or Coho. Uh, in their native range, they will migrate off the Pacific Northwest coast and within a year or two can be off the coast of Japan. And they will find their way back to their spawning ground that they hatched out of or very similar. And it has to do with the, um, it, there's a theory called the hierarchical navigational hypothesis. And a lot of that relies on imprinting of certain chemical cues, certain odorants. So the way the water smells, uh, the unique chemistry of the water. So fish actually have a much more sensitive, of, uh, sensitive smell than even dogs do. Uh, and that helps them find their way back to their spawning regions. So I also perform water choice trials to determine if the young fish will recognize familiar water or not. Uh, and this is getting at the question of did, why rapid out migration occurred, if it was due to unfamiliar water or the lack of imprinting. If we touch on predation a bit, uh, so one of the main concerns with predation is younger age classes. So age zero and age one, resident trout, so brook and brown trout primarily, are often found in higher densities in small, very suitable juvenile habitat type of tributaries. And that would be to understand the impacts of predation on these very young grayling fry. And I focus primarily on the predation rates of brook and brown trout, and also the behavior of the grayling fry itself. Uh, so here, if we look at the images are on the right and left, age one, brook and brown trout, and then also in the center are grayling fry. So these predation trials are done for approximately two months and they start when the fish are about two and a half, three weeks old. So if we examine some of the preliminary results from 2018 and 2019, I did just finish the predation trials for 2021 uh, and I'm working on incorporating the data now. But if we look at the grayling consumed by uh, per hour based on grayling fry age class, so you can see the images across the bottom that corresponds to fish of a particular day age class. So how old they are by day. And these are all to scale with each other. So you can see the changes in development from fry age class one, two, and three. And what you can see is brook and brown trout do prey upon grayling fry as expected. Brown trout do prey upon them at a slightly higher rate than brooks, but the overall trend is that rate of predation decreases as the development of the grayling fry increase. The grayling fry as their development does increase are able to avoid predation better than initially. Going into competition, um, we do believe, of course, that competition between age zero resident trout, so brook and brown trout, could adversely affect grayling survival. And this could be due to a possible size advantage that occurs early in life. Uh, and it would lead to expected aggressive interactions. So for this, I focus on changes in growth, behavioral interactions, and also changes in habitat use. So I have three artificial streams that are set up and they're all identical to the image that you see on the right. The first stream is all grayling. The second stream is 10 grayling and 10 brook trout. So a 50-50 mix. The third stream is a 50-50 mix. So 10 and 10 of grayling and brown trout. And if we look at those preliminary results, what we can see is if we solely focus here on the growth of the grayling fry in each of those treatments, the control is that red dotted line. So that's all grayling. So grayling in the presence of other grayling. The solid blue line is grayling in the presence of brook trout. The green dash line is grayling in the pres presence of brown trout. And what you can see is grayling growth in both the control and in the presence of brook trout is very similar and it's positive growth. So over the course of two months, 
the grayling fry did grow in both size, total length, and in weight. However, in the brown trout treatment, so grayling in the presence of brown trout, what we can see is a relatively flat trend with a slight decline. Um, what you can't see from this plot is that there was also a high level of mortality of the grayling in the presence of brown trout. And this is due to the behavioral interactions that occurred between the two species. So the age zero brown trout regularly would push the grayling into unfavorable habitat. So habitat that didn't have good access to food or other resources. This also occurred with brown trout pushing out other brown trout from the same type of favorable habitat. So three out of 10 brown trout typically became dominant over the stream and pushed all other fish, regardless if they were browns or grayling, out of favorable habitat regions. And that just didn't occur in the presence of brook trout or grayling in the presence of other grayling. So quickly, trout do both prey upon gray fry. Brown trout have a slightly higher predation rate overall. It's not statistically significant. However, it definitely has biological significance. And the rate of predation does decrease as grayling growth and development increases. When we look at competition, the brook trout do not appear to affect grayling growth or survival. And I did also see positive growth in the brook trout as well. Brown trout do have a negative effect on grayling growth and survival. Uh, so that definitely needs to be taken into consideration when we look at reintroduction efforts. Now, there's a few key things that you need to understand about the results that, I'm ha that I see in my lab. They are laboratory results. So the artificial streams that I have set up in my lab, there's no way that the grayling fry can escape the pressures of competition from either brook trout or brown trout or other grayling. So it's a closed stream, a closed system. In nature, the grayling would be able to migrate to a different branch of the tributary or migrate to a deeper pool or a side channel that occurs where brown trout aren't inhabiting. And so that definitely needs to be considered when we transition from laboratory situation into a natural type of setting. So overall, the results definitely give hope that the reintroduction of grayling to Michigan streams will be successful. And this is primarily due to the interactions with brook trout, and then also knowing that in a natural system, the grayling will likely be able to escape the pressures of competition with brown trout. So if we talk about the future a little bit, um, again, I just want to remind you that the goal of the Michigan Arctic Grayling Initiative is to restore self-sustaining populations of Arctic grayling within their historic native range in Michigan. And there's four streams or four watersheds that have formally been nominated and are being explored for biotic and abiotic suitability. And those are the Upper Manistee, the Boardman, Jordan, and Maple Rivers. Other nominations are coming in. Um, we've received a couple nominations for the Asabo River system. Uh, and others, of course, have came in as well with their native park range. So if you or any groups that you belong to are interested in nominating a watershed, you can do so by going to the Michigan Arctic Grayling Initiative. Uh, so it's migrayling.org. You can go to that website and there's instructions on how to nominate a watershed right on that page. And it also has a bunch of other very helpful and interesting information as well. So what about current fish populations? So grayling right now aren't swimming in our streams. There is brood stock that is currently being held at Odin Fish Hatchery and also the Marquette State Fish Hatchery. So the 2019 cohort is in Marquette. The 2021 cohort is currently at Odin. And the goal is to determine where grayling can fit in with the current fish populations that we have in our stream. So our current resident fish. Um, so no fish are going to be removed, called or relocated in order to reintroduce grayling. 
And it's important to acknowledge that rumors abound. So please always check what you hear with someone taking an active role in the reintroduction efforts. And that can be myself or DNR personnel or others that are actively surveying the streams as part of a university project or one of the tribal groups as well. And so just contact one of us if you have any questions about something that you're hearing. And here's just a couple images of the, 2000, uh, the 2019 uh, grayling broodstock. So they were being transported on August 1st of 2019 from my lab at MSU to start their journey as broodstock and they were headed to Odin. These fish have now been transferred to Marquette State Fish Hatchery and are growing very well. So I did mention that climate change is also something else that we need to keep in mind when we talk about the future of grayling, but not only just grayling in our state, but other fish that we have as well. So brook trout, uh, brown trout, we really need to be considering climate change and its impacts to our cold water resources. So I wanted to share with you some information on water temperature and how it affects growth and survival of these fish. So this is a lot of information in this table. Um, the large uh, numbers that you see are all the Fahrenheit. Uh, so for each species, I'm listing the lower optimal growth temperature and the upper, upper optimal growth temperature. And that is the range. So in between those two is the range at which that fish species will have optimal growth and survival, mainly optimal growth, of course. Uh, and once you exceed the upper optimal temperature, there's a range of temperature that the fish won't have too much of an impact by, uh, metabolically. But as you get closer to the lethal temperature, the fish will start to stress and will be negative effect, negatively affected by the water temperature. So again, uh, stress is going to a fish as you transition from the upper optimal to that lethal temperature. So with brook trout, the optimal growth range is 51.8 to 60.8. The lethal temperature is 77.5. For brown trout, it's slightly shifted higher. So 53.6 and 66.2 for the upper or for the optimal growth range. And that's the same as it is for rainbow trout. Lethal temperature for brown trout is 81.7 and 77 for rainbow trout. When we look at Arctic grayling, the optimal growth starts lower than all of the other species at 49.1, but the upper optimal is the same as it is for brook trout at 60.8. Their lethal temperature, however, is the highest of all the fish species that are listed at 84.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So we do need to be concerned about climate change and how it's going to affect our fish and our cold water resources. Um, but I just wanted to provide you with this information so you're aware of what we're talking about when say, if you're a, a fisherman, you've probably heard the 70 degree pledge that if the water temperature is 70 degrees, you don't fish. And that's due to the metabolic stress that occurs once you handle that fish. Even if you're practicing catch and release, simply handling that fish, the act of catching that fish on your fly, bringing it in and releasing it is enough additional stress on that fish to cause it to die. Uh, so that is really important to acknowledge. Uh, so with that, I've covered just about everything and we can transition into questions and answers now. Um, but I wanted to thank you for the invitation to share my research and the initiative information with you as well. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was really interesting. Um, I'll start with actually a couple of questions of my own while we give people a chance to add theirs to the Q&A at the bottom of their screen. Um, the name Grayling, is there any connection to Grayling, Michigan or how did, how did that name come about for the fish? Uh, so Grayling, it, the city of Grayling is actually named after the fish Grayling because Grayling were so plentiful. Uh, the original name for the city of Grayling was Crawford and they ended up changing it to Grayling. Wow. Um, and then my second question is, um, 
I know on the Boardman River, there's been discussions of introducing steelhead. How does that um, impact the conversations of introducing the grayling? So steelhead are simply migratory rainbow trout. Uh, and rainbow trout and steelhead do occur in the some of the regions that grayling occur in Alaska. Uh, so you'll have those two species overlapping there. Um, so I really don't think that they're going to be too much. We lost you at too much. There you are. You're back. Okay, I'm back. Um, so I really don't think since those two species overlap in uh, Alaska somewhat, I don't expect it to be too much of a complication between the two species. Um, but again, other factors would come into play. Um, but as long as the resources are available, um, I didn't particularly study interactions between rainbow trout and grayling. Uh, I only have room for three artificial streams, so I really had to be kind of selective on what I looked at. But I expect rainbow trout uh, to behave closer to like brook trout than uh, brown trout impact. Okay, and I'm gonna start in on the um, participant questions. Um, and I think a few of them you answered throughout the presentation and they were asked early, but I'll um, read them off again in case you have, wanna expound on them. Um, someone asks, where is your lab? So my lab is in East Lansing. It's on uh, Michigan State University's campus. Will brook and brown trout have to be exterminated in waters where these grayling will be introduced? No, they won't. So I touched on that on one of the slides. So that was probably asked a little earlier. Yes, yes, it was. Yeah, it was uh, right. One of the first questions that was put in there. Are the ranges of grayling reducing due to global warming, which you also touched on that a little bit at the end? If you're speaking, we can't um, hear you. Oh, yeah, start at the beginning oh, if you started to answer that question. Sure. Um, so there's a lot of fish, uh, especially native fish, cutthroat trout and such, that have effect been effective negatively by impacts of climate change, but a lot of it is a combination of factors. So it's impacts of climate change, it's impacts of non-native or invasive fish populations. Um, so like cutthroat trout, they're really heavily impacted by the presence of rainbow trout that are not native in their range, and also especially brown trout that aren't native in their range. Um, so there's a lot of factors that are really affecting it. Um, and you know how stable the watershed is. If it's a heavily groundwater fed system, it might have a little more stability. Um, but yeah, the range could be shifted slightly over time. Uh, it'll just it'll take time to see how. We lost you right at the end, Nicole. Yeah. I hear you now. Yep. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so it really, it's just going to take some time to see how things play out. Depending on the watershed, um, that's going to be the big part. Um, but again, it's never just a single factor that's going to affect um, shifts in ecosystems. Um, but climate change definitely is a big one that could potentially have an impact. Any chance of a grayling in the classroom program, similar to what we do with Chinook or sturgeon, at least for schools in the local planting areas? Um, it's hard to say. I would lean towards probably not because of the way the fish need to be in stream. Um, so the salmon in the classroom programs, you actually incubate the eggs in an aquarium in the classroom. 
And for grayling, once they reach that IDAG stage, we need to have them in the remote site incubators in the streams already that we want to reintroduce them to. Um, and that's so they can imprint on that water and not have the effect of rapid out migration. So that would be one of the things that would definitely prohibit the use of grayling in the classroom. Um, plus, they're not as like thermally stable at a young age. So for example, the water temperature needs to be right about 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit during their incubation time. So you would need to make sure that water is remaining really cold. But the big thing is the eggs really need to be in the stream that we're reintroducing them to in that critical period of development at that IDEG stage. Will they be introduced again in the Rifle River? I live on Rifle and would love to see them again. Just saw you guys out a few weeks back. Nicole, if you're answering, we can't hear you. Okay, I think, we're, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I was gonna say okay. maybe, um, maybe turn your screen sharing off too, that might help um, improve it. Yeah, let's try that. Okay. Um, so as far as the Rifle River goes, um, what I would recommend is the Rifle River is the Southern fringe of their range that was historical native grayling range. But the way the Rifle River can get nominated is a town or a fishing club or a group of citizens can nominate the Rifle River to be a grayling reintroduction site. So that you can find the information on migrayling.org. Uh, so just go to the uh, Michigan Grayling Reintroduction website and you contact, I believe it's Jay Wesley with the DNR to submit a nomination and all the instructions are in there. I think it would be great. It does fall within the historic range. So it definitely has potential. And just, it's important to note too, when we're, I'm talking about a nomination of a watershed, um, it would be that watershed. So it might not be like the main stem of the Rifle River, but it could be tributaries that feed in that would receive grayling. Someone says, why not remove brown trout from at least one site to give the grayling a better chance? So a lot of it is just at this point, we're trying to figure out where the grayling can actually fit in. Um, but there are a lot of systems in the watersheds that have say tributaries feeding in that have either little or no brown trout. Used to reintroduce the grayling. And then they're able to mature a bit in that uh, like side channel or side tributary uh, creek um, feeding into more like the large watershed. Um, so as of now there um, and going forward, no fish will be removed. We want to make sure that, you know, we're keeping the ecosystem the way it is right now. And then just seeing where those grayling can fit in. Have you done experiments with brook and grayling and brown with grayling? Do you think they, do you think there is an experiment with both alongside grayling would see any differences? So that was one of the biggest questions that we had to um, figure out early in the research planning. And one of the main reasons that we decided not to do a stream that had grayling, brook and trout was at that point, you're not looking at just the factor of how one species is affecting the other. You would have such a large amount of interactions. It would be difficult to tease out who is affecting who uh, and to what degree. So that's why we decided to just do each species individually. And then you can kind of extrapolate out or learn what you're going to expect to see in the system if you have all of those fish together. Um, there's been studies that have already been done to show the impact. Cut out where you said impact.
Okay, I think I'm back now. Yeah. Okay, so there were there were already studies that had been done to see how um, brook and brown trout affected each other. Um, so we didn't need to do that type of trial. Um, and then bringing grayling into it, people have looked at how brown trout, larger brown trout affect more mature grayling. Um, but there was just, there would be way too many interactions in this, in the trial to do all three in one. We were just getting at how one affects the other, and then you can plan going forward. Do you think the large deposits of sediment from logging practices has changed the rivers too much to be suitable for grayling? So it's important to know how the systems were historically as well. Um, so if anyone's not familiar with how the Aasabal River got its name, uh, Aasabal River actually got the name Aasabal before logging started to occur, which leads people to believe that it obviously had a large amount of sand at that point when it was initially encountered. So, and you can also just based on walking around in Northern Michigan, there's sand everywhere. Our soil is sand. Um, so the systems, yes, logging changed them, but a lot of the sediment has already been allowed to somewhat flush out. Um, a lot of our rivers in Northern Michigan were not historically gravel and cobble rivers. Um, there were sections that would have had gravel and cobble here and there, just glacial deposits, but sand is ever present in our systems uh, and it will always be shifting and it will always be changing. It's important to also know that brook trout uh, can spawn on fine sediment, so like a fine gravel to sand, and grayling are capable of spawning on fine gravel all the way to sand. Uh, it's actually only the fish that are not native that aren't capable of spawning on fine gravel and sand. Will fishing be shut down on river sections where grayling are introduced? That actually hasn't been uh, fully determined yet. So that's kind of a to be determined type of thing. But it's unlikely that fishing would be completely shut down. A lot of it when grayling are first initially reintroduced, they're going to be on very small creeks and streams, not like the main stem of the river. Uh, someone says, I joined the presentation late, may have missed this, but do you have a timetable for the introductions? So about four now, the first grayling will be going into streams at egg stage. So it takes, we have to develop broodstock. So we have a broodstock from 2019 that will mature in three to four years from then. And we need to cross those fish with mature broodstock from this year. So it's not until the 2021 fish are fully mature that we can do our first cross. Just cut out, Nicole. Bam. There you are again. Okay. Uh, so we need to do a cross between uh, broodstock year classes, so 2019 to 2021, to make sure we're not crossing siblings. Uh, and it's going to take three to four years for the 2021 fish to mature. So three to four years from now would be the first attempts to, or would be the first time to be able to collect eggs and put them in the stream. So approximately, let's say four to five years. How do you keep a predator from sitting at the outlet of a remote incubator, picking off the fry as they emerge? So a lot of the tributaries are going to be smaller in size that they're first put in, and you typically don't encounter a lot of large fish. So it's all going to depend on placement of the RSIs. Um, someone says, I believe the dam on the Boardman River was removed. If grayling were introduced in the Boardman, would a weir be needed to keep them from migrating through downtown Traverse City, which wouldn't have the habitat needed? Uh, so fish will migrate throughout systems. Uh, 
if the habitat's not there, so if they encountered warmer water, they'll typically not migrate through it. Um, so it just really determines the, it'll determine the range of the fish based on the habitat that's available for them. Will fishing regulations be affected in streams where grayling will be reintroduced? That is also another to be determined and um, that's not part of my research. So that would be more of a question for the DNR. I have caught grayling while fishing in a small lake in Yellowstone National Park. Are they native or stocked? Uh, so that really depends. Uh, a lot of the grayling in the Montana region did have to be um, re not really reintroduced, but more reestablished. You cut out it reestablished. Okay, can you hear me again? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so they had to stock fish on top of fish that they already had. So it's really hard to say, and I'm not really fully um, sure of where all of the stocking occurred in Montana. So it could have been a native, it could have been a stock fish. It's really hard to say. Um, I'm reading these as I'm going through them. So a few have been sure. duplicative. Uh, when do you anticipate the introduced grayling will spawn? How do you think it will differ from historic Michigan grayling and current Alaskan spawning times? Uh, so they're spring spawners. Uh, they start their spawning run typically in Alaska. They start their spawning run when the water temperature reaches approximately 40 degrees and spawning is over once it's between like 50 and 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so they'll definitely be spring spawners here too. Who are you working with other professors at MSU? Uh, so Dan Hayes is my um, primary committee member and uh, Dr. Troy Zorn as well. So Dr. Hayes and Dr. Zorn. Uh, Troy Zorn is also with uh, Michigan DNR Fish Division in Marquette. Um, and then I also have two additional committee members, Dr. Mike, uh, Michael Wagner and Dr. Jeanette Bauman are on my committee as well. But MSU's fisheries department is gigantic uh, and so is our ecology evolution and behavior. So I work with both of them and multiple professors and each have always helped out. So aside from my formal committee members, a lot of people. <laughs> Um, can we still get those cool grayling stickers I see in the fly shops? This oh, might not be you something know, you know about, or maybe it is. <laughs> so normally if I do in-person presentations, I come, I come equipped with a stack of stickers. Oh. And since everything's been on Zoom, I haven't been able to do that. Um, I'm not sure if Michigan DNR still has a stockpile of them. Um, I will see what I can get my hands on. And if you're familiar with Gates Lodge in Grayling, Michigan, my sister is uh, one of the shop managers and I can leave some with her if I'm able to get some. <laughs> um, someone says the Brook Trout Coalition has interest in working on a cooperative study with other organizations such as Adams Chapter of Trout Unlimited, the GLCI, the GTCD, the Grant and Travers Band, and the MDNR on the Boardman River. What specific type of study would be of the greatest value to MAGI in pursuing the reintroduction of grayling to the Boardman River? So I'm not sure what research has already been done on the Boardman, um, so I really hesitate to completely answer that question. A lot of it is going to have to be consensus of what the um, biotic and abiotic uh, habitats are. And um, so like, what is the stream biota? What's the food available? What is the fish population uh, made up of? What are the densities of the fish? What are the temperature fluctuations? What are the flows? Um, so that would be first important to know what's already occurred before going on to what still could be done. 
what changes in fishing regulations would you expect on grayling streams? So it's really hard to say. Um, again, the grayling initially are be, will be introduced to tributaries that feed into more main stems. Um, so in the past, when they've reintroduced grayling, um, you just couldn't be targeting grayling at that time. Um, but the goal is to have self-sustaining populations of grayling. So eventually the goal is to have a fishery for them. Um, so right now it's a little too early to say what changes may occur in fishing regulations though. And that's not actually part of my realm right now. So I wouldn't want to speak for the DNR on that one. <laughs> is there a way to be more involved with the reintroduction? Uh, check out the migrailing.org website. Um, that always has updates uh, and contact information as far as things that can be done. Uh, depending on where you live, there could be some surveys that you can help out with. Um, so yeah, definitely check out the Michigan Grayling website for sure. That would be a good start. And as far as I can see, this will be the last question. So if anybody has one that they've been holding back, go ahead and put that in the Q&A, but I'm gonna read off what I believe is the last one. Were future stream temperature changes considered in selecting the four recipient streams? That is, were those four predicted to remain cooler relative to other potential recipient streams? So I'm not sure exactly what studies and surveys have been done on there. Um, but they would have been accepted for nomination if they were thought to be suitable both currently and in the future. Okay, and then we had one more. GDSU and Grand Traverse Band is working on abiotic and biotic habitat assessments. The Boardman River this past summer and next spring. Or I guess that one's not a question, more of a comment. Yes, that's awesome. I'm so glad that's being done. Thank you so much. There's huge help. Um, and we're getting a few more rolling in. How will the grayling impact the existing trout populations? Uh, so based on the research that I have in my labs, I or in my lab, I don't really think that it would be much of an impact. Uh, again, like we said, we're just trying to figure out where the grayling can fit in. Uh, and the goal is to, of course, not negatively affect current populations in the streams. Were the last Michigan grayling to survive around 1930s actual Michigan grayling, or were they fish from Montana or elsewhere? Does a genetic reservoir of Michigan grayling exist in any fashion where genetics from Michigan grayling could be somehow introduced back into the grayling being reintroduced? So Michigan grayling were Arctic grayling. Uh, so that's important to note. Um, in the late, in the 1800s through the really early, like before 1907, they still would have been, I'm expecting primarily fish that would have been the historic population of grayling. Um, so as far as any reservoirs of the historic grayling that were here, there's not any that I'm aware of. Uh, and if you were to try and reintroduce fish from a very small reservoir, you would have a very high likelihood of reaching a genetic bottleneck, um, which is actually part of the reason that we're not using Montana fish this time around. Um, in Montana, they've already gone, they already had to reestablish broodstock to then put into their streams. So by the time we would establish That's why we're getting our fish from Alaska this time around. Okay, I think that wraps up the questions. Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you to everybody for bearing with us. I know sometimes the, the Wi-Fi issues can be a little frustrating, but um, we stuck with it. And as you can see from my screen, <laughs> we know it's fall. It's gotten darker. I didn't turn the light on in my uh, dining room where I'm at. Um, so please have a great evening, everyone. And thank you so much, Nicole. We hope you'll join us again um, in November for our um, archae underwater archaeology presentation. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it.